Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. Our roundup from the region this week includes an eye on Abbas. As Obama warns him that the window to peace could be about to slam shut, we look at what legitimacy the Palestinian leader has to win hearts and support for tough concessions at home. The press in prison. Reporters are back in court in Cairo, up on charges of spreading false information and aiding the Muslim Brotherhood. Our correspondents show us how dangerous it has become to deliver the news in Egypt. And finally, we bring you to Art Dubai, a cultural crossroads that wants to take on the world's contemporary art scene. It's work already attracting the biggest galleries from across the EU and the US. Well, no longer any great expectations that the current round of peace talks between Israeli and Palestinian leaders will lead to a done deal. America, which is chairing the negotiations, now says it would be happy with a framework to allow discussions to continue. US President Barack Obama has been meeting with both sides, calling for tough concessions, but admitting that the Gulf of Mistrust gapes as wide as ever. Hopes of a resolution anytime soon are next to none, with the power Mahmoud Abbas wields at home also coming into question. This was an important meeting for Mahmoud Abbas, one to one with Barack Obama. And it comes as the clock is counting down on the US imposed April deadline for completing Israeli Palestinian peace talks. The president of the Palestinian Authority is under heavy pressure from all sides and he appealed for support at home, a call that was answered in the West Bank. Dozens of rallies were held, including here in Ramallah. We're here to support Mahmoud Abbas. We're students, part of a forward-thinking youth movement, and we're here to say that we support our president. A different picture in Gaza, however. Despite dozens of Fatah members travelling there to drum up support, pro-Abbas rallies were banned in the territory by Hamas, and several activists were quietly arrested. The lack of outward support here shows that the president of the Palestinian Authority is still not welcome in Gaza. Even on his own turf, Abbas is under attack. Former senior Fatah official Mohammed Dahlan has made a spectacular comeback in recent days. Viewed as a potential successor, Dahlan delivered a scathing appraisal of the current leader on Egyptian television. Palestinians can no longer endure the disaster that is Mahmoud Abbas. Since the day he came to power, tragedy has multiplied for the Palestinian people. Abbas no longer represents Fatah, he represents the destruction of the Palestinian Authority, the looting of the Palestinian Authority and all the evil in the lives of Palestinians. And yet, in the eyes of the experts, Mahmoud Abbas remains the main leader of the Palestinian people. Abbas, By persevering with the peace process, even if progress is incredibly slow, he's managed to get results for the Palestinians. For example, the UN recognizing Palestine as a state. Yes, it's a non-member state, but nevertheless, this is a significant diplomatic achievement. And in the eyes of the international community and the Israelis, Mahmoud Abbas is the only legitimate leader of the Palestinians. Egypt's president says he will spare no effort to work towards the speedy resolution for one reporter, Australian Peter Grest, currently behind bars and awaiting trial in Cairo. He and his fellow Al Jazeera colleagues will be back in court next week. In total, however, some 20 journalists are currently detained, accused of spreading false news and supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Hosni Mubarak was not known for press freedom, but since his fall, reporters living in Egypt say that doing their job has gotten increasingly dangerous. Our correspondent Sonia Juri and Yuka Royer report. Assem Mohammed and Aden Fahmi, the brothers of jailed Al Jazeera journalists, share their concerns. For more than two months, Egyptian Canadian Mohammed Fahmi and Egyptian Bahre Mohammed have been in detention, along with their Australian colleague Peter Grest. All three work for Al Jazeera International and are accused of manipulating footage and supporting the Muslim Brotherhood that's now been branded a terrorist organisation. Their family members say the accusations are without grounds and they shouldn't be in jail. He would never ever jeopardise the, 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 the well-being of Egypt. You know, there are no evidence to, to incriminate them. It's not right to play around with people's lives like that. Fahmi and Grest were arrested at this hotel in Cairo on charges of working without a permit. Egyptian television aired this footage, filmed just after their arrest, playing suspenseful music in the background and showing their mobile phones as if they were evidence at a crime scene. 
Cameraman Mohammed was roughed up by police and arrested at his home. He wrote a letter from prison to his wife and two children, defending the freedom of speech. He said he was just trying to do his job and be professional. He didn't understand why they were arresting journalists when the revolution was supposed to have brought freedom of expression back to the country. The two men think the arrests were an attempt by the Egyptian authority to try and silence the Qatar-based channel. Accused of helping a terrorist group, the journalist could face up to 15 years in prison. Shaima Abul Kai works for the Committee to Protect Journalists, a media watchdog. She's concerned about the rapid decline of press freedom in her country. We're seeing flagrant attacks on journalists by security forces and random arrests targeting all types of journalism. The CPJ has placed Egypt as the third deadliest country in the world for journalists on the job. Foreign journalists working in the country are also beginning to feel a change in the climate, like Ursula Lindsay, an American living in Egypt for 12 years. So I worked at independent magazines, local magazines under Mubarak, and there were certainly concerns with censorship, with uh, negative reaction from the state. But overall, we were not anywhere near as concerned as we are today. We definitely have less freedom of expression and more suspicion towards journalists and hostility towards journalists than I think at any time that I've been here. This hostile sentiment towards foreign journalists has in part been driven by state and private Egyptian media, portraying them as being supportive of Islamist groups. Contacted by France 24, the Egyptian authorities have so far declined to talk about the subject. While reiterating their commitment to respecting the freedom of expression, they remain vague about the rights of journalists to interview members of the banned Islamist movement. A draft law allowing children as young as nine to get married, permitting marital rape and restricting women's rights in terms of parenting, inheritance and divorce is causing controversy in Iraq. Passed by the Council of Ministers in February, it is currently before the Parliament, which is debating whether or not to enact it. Shirley Sitbon has the details. In Iraq, marriage is officially legal for men and women over 18. 25 percent of women still wed earlier. But a new draft bill, the Jafari Personal Status Law, allows men to marry girls as young as nine, under certain conditions, even toddlers. The draft law represents a crime against humanity because it contains text and rules that endanger the innocence of childhood. We could go so far as to say it's a crime against childhood. It accepts that a child can get married even if she's less than nine years old. And under the new law, her father or grandfather can marry her off as young as just a year old. Child marriage is one of the draft's many controversial articles. The government approved it last month. Now it's up to Iraq's parliament to decide whether to ratify the legislation, which only applies to Shiites. A majority of Iraqis are opposed to it. But the bill does have supporters in the Shiite community. Analysts say Prime Minister Nour al-Maliki backs the draft to please these voters ahead of April's elections to parliament. Several MPs say there's little chance the text will pass. I don't think Parliament will vote in this legislation. There are too many obstacles, too many protests against it. Human Rights Watch says the law violates international conventions which Iraq has ratified. The group says it also contradicts Iraq's own constitution, which prohibits in Article 14 discrimination between Iraqis. Well, turning now to something lighter to finish this show, it's the biggest art fair to take place in the Middle East and South Asia, and it attracts the biggest galleries from the EU and the US. Art Dubai has been growing by the year, and this edition, entitled Meanwhile History, is, according to its organisers, a protest against forgetting. But as you will see, it's also about letting in the light. Our correspondent in Dubai reports. <laughs> Beneath one of the most luxurious hotels in the world, Art Dubai has opened its doors for the eighth time. It has become a must-see event for contemporary art fans in the Middle East. They are from Iran, Syria, Lebanon and many other countries. 
Art Dubai is a very important cultural crossroad for the region. There are artists, writers coming from all over the world, people working in museums and different cultural institutions. This year, about 1,000 artworks are being exhibited across 80 galleries. Among the most highly rated artists is Samia Halabi, who is considered a pioneer of contemporary Arab art. For her, Dubai is an ideal haven for her fellow artists. In these paintings, I use the colours of the light, the sunset's light. The important thing now is that there is peace here. The rest of the Arab world has often been attacked. These countries have seen upheavals. Each of her pieces is worth over $40,000. As the country is booming again, it is home to some of the world's richest people. Its art industry is attracting more and more international actors, like this American gallery. There's a market of collectors here in this region, that's true. I certainly don't know the details of their portfolio of shares, but they buy the same art pieces as American collectors. I mean, their buying power is the same. The UAE is working hard to achieve its dream of becoming a cultural hub. An hour's drive away, Abu Dhabi is building a number of prestigious projects, including a Guggenheim and the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which is due to open next year. Peter Armstrong is overseeing the construction work. So this area will be, the sea will come into this area. An iconic dome designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel. There are about 11,000 pieces of steel that are being put together right down to the millimeter. There's crisscross layers of aluminium cladding that create this rain of light effect as the sunlight passes through. And it's approximately 650 million US dollars. A lump sum that does not include art pieces and landscaping. An investment that aims to put the UAE on the cultural map and diversifying what is offered to tourists, which today is very much limited to beaches, shopping malls and leisure. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget you can catch it all again on our website, francefancat.com, and feel free to leave us your comments and questions. Until next time, do take care.